Good evening and welcome to Have We Got Planning News For You. Um, thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, may I start with the usual reminder um, to consider making a charity donation in lieu of a registration fee. And you know by now we support the charities, the NHS Combined Charities Just Giving page, Brian May's Save Me uh, and uh, Shelter. But please do feel free to um, choose a charity of your choice if you so prefer. Um, now, we have today um, a, a very special guest, Mr. President himself, Tim Corshaw, <laughs> the new president of the RTPI, and uh, as Mary observed uh, yes, yesterday between us, the third president of the RTPI um, to have been so kind as to join us. So, Tim, um, thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell us where you're calling from? Uh, what have you chosen our your theme this evening and uh, what are you drinking? Right, absolutely. Well, I'm I'm joining you from Richmond, North Yorkshire, so right in the middle of Rishi Sunak's um, constituency. Uh, I'm in a converted <laughs> church, so if it echoes, it's because I'm doing my own sermon in here. Um, what am I drinking? Well, um, I'm drinking Arizona watermelon cocktail because it's a bit wow. early for me, uh, in the year, um, and um, I've also brought this as a as, ah. as a link to my other theme, which is film. But we'll maybe talk about that later. Ah, Phil, fantastic. Well, Tim, we're really hugely looking forward to hearing your thoughts, particularly on levelling up, um, mm. hot off the press, the, the white paper. So uh, Mary's going to lead the interview with you uh, in the second half of the show. So really, really looking forward to hearing that. In the meantime, let's hear from the panel, starting as always with Mary, the different location to where you normally are. I well, last time, of course, I was I was I was skiing. And on the basis that the theme is a film, I thought I'd bring my bag of popcorn. Mm. So here's my bag of popcorn that I should be tucking into during the show. But otherwise, I am being very good and drinking water because sadly I've got COVID. Oh, Mary. Oh, well, hey. Get well, get well soon. Paul, how are you, your mate? I'm very well, Charlie. Thank you. I obviously have always uh, had the film as my theme. I've got Stormtroopers up there. I've got yeah. uh, the Terminator up there. But I'm joined by my wife's favourite film, which is Roman Holiday and one of the original movie posters with the lovely Audrey Hepburn to my left. Um, but as one Yorkshireman to another, um, I have to say I've gone a little over the top and a little random when it comes to the choice of drink because I've taken the film theme a little too far and I've gone for some Lost. Um, so oh. the David Lynch film, although the, the actual chapter, the actual film name is the last chapter and I never understood a word of it. So <laughs> cheers, Tim. Nice to see you. Cheers, Paul. That's the Vista. Um, Chris, how are you, mate? I'm uh, very well. I'm very well. I am. Um, I'm enjoying the theme. Thank you very much for that. So, so my T-shirt, one of my favourite films, ah. Ted. <laughs> I thought for a minute you might say Paddington, but then I realised no. Yeah, different kind of film, Mary. Different kind of guess. film. Okay, uh, I've got a quick quiz with the beers. Okay, you got to guess. Tell me what the film is and who is the lead actor. Cars. Taxi driver. And who was the lead actor? Rob De Niro. Absolutely. You are ahead. Okay, second. This is easy. Godfather. 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 Marlon Brando, Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. Yeah, you are well ahead. You are well ahead. Okay, this one. Mm. Pass. Bandit. Smokey and the... Smokey oh. and the Bandits. Okay, <laughs> Jay. Well, Burt Reynolds. Yeah, God, you're smashing it out of the park, yeah. Sasha. Okay, last one. <laughs> This is easy. Oh, you don't want me at your pub quiz, Desperados. do you? Desperados. Yes. <laughs> Desperado, who's the lead actor? Gosh, give us a clue. Uh, Antonio. Oh, but Bandera. Banderas. There you go. Sasha, oh, yeah. brilliant. <laughs> and of course, Sasha, great to see you as always. You're the one who's actually got some movie or movies in the blood. Yeah, I've, I've got... I've went into my basement and found one of my father's old films. It's not very politically <laughs> correct. I'm not sure you've really released well. a film in 2022 called The Pope Must Die. But in 1989, <laughs> it was appropriate with, with Robbie Coltrane. It was a, that was a, one of my father's films. And I'm in London and I'm delighted to see Tim. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Well, it's Charlie Banner here. I'm in uh, North Somerset, just... Uh, place called Yatton, uh, which is in the red zone for the storm. So we're um, doing an inquiry about a remnant orchard, which has six, sta four standing trees left in it, which are all predicted to fall over within 10 years, according to our boriculturists. We're a little bit worried um, that they might fall over tonight or tomorrow. <laughs> um, um, so uh, may not be an orchard to argue about when we come back on Tuesday, but we're all, we're all heading over back to, back to safer places. Um, after. So I've got a pint of, or a half pint now of cider, um, 
I'm a massive fan of Terminator, like you, Paul, Highlander too. But one of my favourite actors is Denzel Washington. And um, 10 years ago, um, he, he had a fantastic film, which Rob's going to have their flyer on. One of my, my all-time uh, favourites, um, Denzel Washington Flight. Um, anyway, we're going to now start with um, the um, the Chatham case. Paul, you're going to tell us about a, a planning appeal from Chatham in Kent. Uh, yes, I am, Charlie. Uh, this was a decision of Mr. Inspector Hartley um, issued on the 7th of February following a four day inquiry uh, where uh, Paul Brown and James Neal uh, crossed swords. It was a scheme for 800 dwellings, uh, a quarter of which were affordable primary school uh, retail and various infrastructure. Initially, it had been an application, as you can see from the page, for a GP surgery, but that was amended down to a community facility stroke nursery. Not entirely sure what the community facility was going to be, but there we are. Um, it's one of those sad tales, because if you actually look at that page, you'll see the application was submitted in March of 2019, refused two years later in uh, March of 2021, and the appeal was actually allowed in February of 2022. There's something going wrong with our system where we've got three years for housing, which is actually granted on a greenfield unallocated site um, because there is a need for housing. We, we, th th this is a bit of an object lesson. The, the main issues from the case are fairly straightforward. Um, it was a site which is located outside the settlement boundary, but the, uh, the plan was as recently adopted as 2003. Um, there was three and a half years housing land supply, uh, and it was broadly agreed that the effect of the proposed development uh, would have a moderate effect on the landscape and that after mitigation, after 15 years, that the impacts will be relatively modest. The interesting thing is not, act not the arguments between the two principal parties, but the length of the decision, which deals with third party issues. There is a huge amount of uh, depth that the inspector has gone into in terms of issues such as highways, air quality, ecology, you name it. It's an issue that's being thrown at it, notwithstanding that those were not main issues. The, the decision itself... Well, the PDS 48 pages long, but the decision runs to about 35 pages, of which I would guess about half to two thirds is dealing with third party issues. Mm. We perhaps need to take a step back and think about how you address these in reports, because fundamentally there needs to be a recognition that where there's a statement of common ground with stack consultees, with internal consultees, that there isn't a need for the inspector to spend page after page saying why the obvious uh, is correct. So it's a straightforward issue, granted consent for outline consent for 850 houses. And the inspector at the very end says some interesting things about the emerging plan, which is part of the council's case, uh, saying that he could not afford any intention to any significant weight to the intention in decision making to the uh, uh, allocations which were coming forward. Uh, no certainty that any such intention would happen. And hence, this isn't a matter that alters or outweighs his overall conclusions. Straightforward, but actually quite a sad decision. So back to you, Charlie. Thanks, Can I just make one observation, which is that last week we had another decision from Medway where, again, mm. there was a huge amount of local um, third party interest. And in that decision, a completely different location, I accept, but still Medway. And in that location, the inspector, again, spent a lot of time dealing with third party issues and in the end refused it. Mm. Just an yeah. interesting contrast. Absolutely interesting contrast. Absolutely. I should say that I meant to say at the beginning, um, some people, more perceptive people looking behind might think, am I doing this from my bathroom? Uh, I'm not. I'm in a slightly strange hotel suite where there's no difference between the bathroom and the, and the, <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and, the and the desk is in front of the bathroom. So I'm not doing this. I think that means you are loo. in the bathroom. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not on the loo. I'm you like, are in the bathroom. I'm actually on a desk. It's chargeable by the hour, Charlie. For the, for the avoidance of doubt. <laughs> no, um, is there a desk with the loo? So um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I could I have to think of something about that no. Chris, you're going to tell us about something that was in, in some respects a sort of double app between you and me It was, it was uh, So um, this is a site in Soham in East Cambridgeshire If we just bring up the decision there You can see it's an appeal by Persimmon Homes uh, East Midlands And um, it was 175 houses on a greenfield site. Now, uh, Michael Boniface was the inspector and he allowed the appeal. Um, and I think if we've got some, uh, we've got a, a map just showing us where that site is. It's on the uh, edge of town. Oh, oh, there we go. We just got the layout. Um, and then uh, I think we've got um, a photograph of the site just proving it's greenfield. Oh, look at that. That's the that's the finished product. That's the finished product. Uh, that isn't how it looks at the moment, but that's how it will be. Lots of green space. I just say about the residents. 
I thought the residents were represented by the local authority. I thought that's what the local authority were doing. So you get the local authority and then you get all the residents issues as well. So you end up getting a huge amount of objection at these inquiries. Need to be careful where the airtime is spent in the middle of a housing crisis. Just a thought. Um, anyway, moving on, uh, if we have a look at the um, reasons, uh, the inspector allowed this appeal. Uh, the development plan was the East Cambridgeshire local plan, and it wasn't that old, 2015. Uh, had a policy, growth one, uh, which expected delivery of 11,500 homes in East Cambridgeshire during the plan period. That's up to 2031. And uh, there would be an additional 1,500 uh, that would be met by neighbouring authorities under the duty to cooperate. Uh, growth 2 provided the locational strategy to deliver mm. the expected growth. So that was the settlement hierarchy in the strategy. The majority of the development being focused in the main market towns, of which Soham was one. Development supported within the defined development envelopes and then strictly controlled outside it. But if we go forward to the next couple of paragraphs, paragraph 11 was growth policy four. And that said that sites will be allocated for a huge part of that six and a half thousand on the edge of the towns and includes a list of allocations. And the supporting text refers to broad locations. So a lot of that eleven and a half thousand in this plan that runs to 2031 is actually to be done through broad locations on the edge of key settlements like Soham. And the key diagram showed um, roughly where that was, which included this site. But get this, the broad locations were said to be indicative, but the supply was anticipated in the latter part of the plan period. Well, these sites can't happen overnight. It often takes many, many years, five years at least often, to get these sites up and running. So how are they going to deliver the houses if they would just remain broad locations? Now, the council had anticipated in the development plan that they would produce a, a site specific plan to progress these. But as we can see in the last sentence of paragraph 12, the council abandoned its uh, attempt to prepare a new local plan during the examination process. So the allocations and the broad locations to turn into allocations disappeared. Well, the inspector wasn't very impressed with this. If we just move forward, uh, he says that uh, it was agreed between the parties that growth one was out of date. That's because it was more than five years old. Uh, we know that causes it to be automatically out of date as if it isn't subject to review, it finds it still up to date. And so the identified housing requirement was out of date. Um, the council were pursuing a new single issue plan instead of the allocation plan but that had a long way to go. And then finally, paragraph 14, the inspector said there was much debate at the inquiry uh, about growth two and growth four and whether they can be considered out of date. Uh, and we often get a bit of uncertainty around this issue, but Mr Boniface had no difficulty saying, based on the evidence put before me, there's little doubt in my mind that they should be. Growth policy two is a locational strategy predicated on delivering the requirements um, contained in the out-of-date policy growth one. So if your requirement is out of date, your strategy is out of date. And as a consequence of which he found policies out of date and he granted the appeal. He wasn't certain about the five-year land supply, suggesting if the council's figure is 6.5 years, but he, he, he wasn't concerned because what he could see was the council were already running into trouble, not bringing forward these broad locations into site specific plans. And so something needed to be done and Persimmon were brave enough to do that. So uh, well done, Charlie. I think we've got the appearances at the end. Uh, there we go. Uh, Paul <laughs> Hill and his team from RPS. Uh, and we can see a full complement of that. So well done, Charlie. You landed that one. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, and of course, I only got, only got that case because you were um, overbooked doing your um, other appeal at the same time. But no, I was going to, I think, really interesting also that the inspector found this concordance with plan as a whole, despite the fact that it was a, a conflict with one of the policies. Um, but he said there was conflict with no material planning harm underlying it. So two, although he found there was a five year supply, um, two routes to permission, one according to the plan as a whole, um, despite the conflict with the don't develop outside the settlement boundary policy. And second, as you say, the most important policies were out of date for other reasons, tilted balance apply. Um, I'm going to go up next and, and I'm going to tell, tell you all about a, um, 
a Gladman appeal from a Mendip district. And the, the headline actually is a bit of a contrast because this was the case, uh, another what, a development which was uh, outside but adjacent to um, the settlement boundary. Um, and uh, there was a uh, objection in, in relation to the effect on landscape character and appearance, much of the things. There was a three and a half year supply. So tilted balance was engaged on five year supply uh, grounds, um, but the appeal was dismissed. So uh, a, a contrast to the Soham case where there was a five year supply, uh, the appeal was allowed. Um, so why did Inspector Reed um, find that the appeal should be dismissed? Well, it was an outline application. Uh, it was for 95 dwellings in a place called Chill Compton in, in Somerset in Mendip District. And uh, by the time that the inquiry happened, um, the three main issues were whether the proposal complied with the development plan's spatial strategy, the effect on character and appearance of the area, including landscape impacts, and uh, whether the services and facilities for the village were able to accommodate the amount of development proposed. And on the, the settlement hierarchy, spatial strategy points, uh, the inspector found that the development would mean that Chill Compton would be in relation to villagers at the top end of village growth during the planned period. So on one level, he said it would skew, his words, the spatial strategy of the development plan away from the main towns. But he didn't think it would seriously undermine the spatial strategy and that's repeated elsewhere. So the, the inspector looked at this, well, we need to look at the real harm on the ground. So no knockout point in relation to settlement hierarchy, spatial strategy. It turned on whether this would be a disproportionate or inappropriate addition to this particular village. Not to be determined mathematically, he said, but based on an assessment of the scheme. So he then turned to character and appearance. And here he did make some quite substantial negative findings. It wasn't a designated landscape. It wasn't a valued landscape. But nonetheless, the inspector considered that um, the appeal site was fairly prominent, it rose to about 200 metres above the main village. And so there were a number of views up towards various properties, uh, from various properties towards the site, as well as public views from roads and footpaths. And he still felt that relationship uh, between the rising ground and the appeal site of the village was an important factor. Um, and despite the fact that it wasn't a valued landscape um, or a statutory landscape, uh, the inspector considered the change uh, from open pasture to residential housing would fundamentally change, his words, the rural character of the site, substantial adverse effects. He thought the LVIA that the appellants had put in had downplayed the effects. He was particularly critical of, of the admission of the LVIA to, to assess the impact on nearby residential occupiers. And he said, whilst recognising there's no right to review, um, these are high sensitive receptors that are adversely affected. They should have been assessed. So that's a note of caution for people either writing or reviewing LVIAs. Make sure you, even if they they may not uh, win or lose the day in planning terms, make sure you don't fail to have regard to residential uh, receptors and amenity impacts. And overall, the inspector felt the proposal would significantly harm the character and appearance of the area, adversely affecting the form of the village. It wouldn't be a logical extension, unduly large individual estate detached from the main built-up core, incongruously located, um, and so on. Um, so he took um, quite heavily against the, uh, the development's impacts. Um, then there was a second point which related to um, service and facilities, in particular school. So the a particular issue was that um, the local village primary school was bursting at the seams and was turning people away. And so there was a need for... Um, an additional expansion to that school uh, to accommodate the 31 extra primary children um, generated by the development. Um, and the local education authority had accepted a planning obligation that would contribute £566,000 to fund the necessary places. And on that basis, the local education authority with the statutory consultee to whom great weight had to be given as the inspector recognised, they had no problem with it. However, the inspector noted that because this school was an academy, um, the LEA didn't control it. Although it was a state school, it was the, the arrangements of the school were different. And there had to be agreement with the Academy Trust for the um, uh, upgrades. It, and, and the Academy Trust hadn't agreed. It wasn't <coughs> totally clear on the basis from the decision, the basis uh, whether the Academy Trust was objecting to the development or it simply was seeking an additional um, uh, additional funds for expansion. But the, there wasn't agreement in place. And the inspector felt that the lack of agreement with the Academy Trust meant that the expansion plans which the 106 would provide for uh, were uncertain, which is a deeply unsatisfactory position, his words, 
uh, in a situation where the sustainability credentials were critical, because if the academy wasn't upgraded, uh, parents would have to ship their kids or drive their kids off to um, a primary school in another village, and that would affect the sustainability. Uh, and he felt that was a significant adverse impact of the scheme. Um, so putting it together, notwithstanding the tilted balance, uh, 3.6, I think it was a 3.5 year supply, the inspectors felt that the landscape harm combined with the uncertainty about the primary uh, school, because it was an academy, uh, would significantly once we outweigh the benefits. The two key lessons, well, three key lessons, I suppose, is um, five year supply is important, but as the contrast this and so shows, not necessarily the be all and end all. Um, secondly, um, that um, even in a uh, undesignated, non valued landscape, um, landscape impacts may, particularly for some inspectors, not all of them, for some, be showstoppers. And thirdly, um, be very careful if the local school that needs to be upgraded is an academy school. Don't just rely on local education authorities' non-objection. You need to make sure that the academy is on board. Um, and, um, it, yeah, a real risk factor, actually, where the academy, for whatever reason, decides not to come on board. So bear that in mind. I think that's quite important. Um, now, on the back of that, we go back to Sasha, who's going to tell us about a judicial review um, uh, up by uh, Whitley Parish Council. I am. But before I do, I'm just going to raise one point that I think we should all note, and particularly for those watching, and that is the judgment of the Court of Appeal this week in Council General for Wales, in which it was emphasised the importance of keeping confidential judgments that are yet to be delivered. And I just think all of us, when we send out emails to people saying this is confidential, it really is confidential. And that if anyone is involved in litigation in the High Court, they need to read that judgment because it's so emphatic about the responsibilities of all parties to comply with that requirement. So I just raise that on a serious note before I raise deal with the case. And I just wanted to deal, I'm dealing with a case in the High Court, a judgment, very recent judgment in the High Court, which effectively was uh, handed down last week. And it basically, yet again, it's a recurring theme about planning officers' reports. And in that case, the claimants had seven grounds of challenge, and it effectively dealt with the grant of a planning permission by North Yorkshire County Council's mineral authorities and waste authorities. And this was a, for a pulverised fuel ash proposal. And it was in the Green Belt. And the fundamental question that faced the officers and the members was what was its status in Greenbelt terms? And the overall view reached was by the officers was that it was effectively an inappropriate development proposal when considering Power 145. But the claimant's principal challenge was along the lines, that actually, potentially, they had fallen into error by considering elements that were appropriate and indicated it was appropriate. So effectively, the case deals with when you have a large development, some elements might be alleged to be appropriate, some might be inappropriate. How do you reach an overall judgment in 145 terms? And what the court did was re reiterate the Chemnall Manor case, which, which effectively says that in deciding whether development in the Greenbelt is inappropriate development, that development must be considered as a whole and not by reference to any part or parts thereof. So you can't salami slice and for effectively if they're appropriate elements decide it's appropriate, inappropriate, inappropriate. You've got to be an overall judgment, a planning judgment effectively as to where it falls. Now, in this case, it was concluded by the judge that North Yorkshire had properly, the officer had properly considered it was inappropriate and had properly considered the very special circumstances. So the judgment overall was that the the the, the authority had, had effectively considered the matter legally and i would just lastly like to emphasize that remember the courts and i wonder if the others here i would just say that the courts do seem to be pulling away from being overly critical of officers reports and reiterating the dicta in mansell which gives a relatively um higher threshold for bringing down planning officers reports thank you charlie Thanks, Asha. No, I agree. I think that's absolutely right. Now, uh, Mary, over to you to introduce so, our, our presidential special guest. Indeed, indeed. And we are joined this evening uh, by the lovely Tim. Now, I'm going to describe Tim. First of all, of course, he is the new 
president of the Royal Town Planning Institute. But he is also one of Darlington's finest. That's how I'm going to encapsulate you. One of Darlington's finest, (laughs) whose latest career move, and and he's made many career moves, uh, Mm -hmm. has found him to be elected as, as the president. Now, I just want to say a little bit about Tim's background, because I think he's an inspiration. I think his journey and his story is an inspiration to lots of youngsters uh, listening to this show. And so I'm I'm going to start by just going back to his early days when he, for five years, studied architecture at Manchester before having to drop out uh, um, for economic reasons, uh, to be to be brutally frank about it. Um, followed by a career which then started designing greetings cards. You, there's a theme here. Uh, 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 uh. He then ran um, projects for young offenders and be- moved into garden and landscape design, then moved on to designing websites before being drawn into studying for a master's in urban design, which I think you completed, Tim, in 2005. And he then secured a post with, of course, being one of Darlington's finest, Darlington Council. How obvious, you might say. Mm. And before too long, he became responsible for the production of what turned out to be an award-winning design SPD. And I'm just going to take you back to uh, uh, um, to um, those days. So we're going back to 2011. And uh, Rob, can you just pull up, please, the front cover of Distinctly Darlington? So that was an SPD that won the um, an RTPI award. And although it's not splashed all over the cover, as I think perhaps it would be nowadays, um, it actually it's known as distinctly Darlington. You then went on to do another um, document, the Town Centre Fringe Master Plan. And again, just by, uh, by way of a little trip down memory lane, uh, <laughs> can we have a little look at the front cover of, of that one? Because that's a that's a, a great um, document. When I looked at that, I one of the things that really grabbed me was how you got some pictures in there about your public consultation exercise, and there were lots of kids involved, which I thought was great. Um, anyway, since then, thank you very much, Rob. Since then, you've been involved um, in your own practice. And of course, you've achieved not only membership of the uh, Royal Town Planning Institute, you also are a, a member of the Royal Society of Arts. Um, so you are a very well-connected Darlington finest um, young man, if I may say so. And here we are interviewing you. I'm interviewing you tonight, really, in your capacity as RTPI president. But I I just want to start off by asking you uh, and focusing the first few questions on on you personally. Um, We know that there are some 27,000 members of the RTPI. But Tim, how many of them do you think are urban designers? Um, I actually don't have the stats. So I did. I did. <laughs> I did try and do some research on this matter, so I wouldn't be left left hanging on that first question. Going, Mm-mm, I don't know. Um, I, I imagine there will be. I would have thought maybe people who identify as I did urban design as my training, probably a smallish number, you know. Yeah. Um, but, but one of the things I do say is that actually by by what we do, we're kind of all urban designers. I know this sounds like a bit of a crazy idea, but just bear with me. But through decisions, through words, through policy, through lots of things, we are making a change on a daily basis, whether that's change over a 20-year period or change over a much shorter period through a decision. And actually, each one of those builds the picture, that big jigsaw of place. So actually, we should be... It, there's no real division between kind of what urban designers think they're doing and what planners think they're doing in some ways. Because actually, your actions, decisions, words, even if you don't draw them, you are setting the tone. One of the things where I brought the milk, and this is, a, this is the film. Yes, yes. I mean, I haven't, I haven't mentioned the other secret yeah. career. All right. But, but yeah, so, <laughs> tell right, us about okay, it. Tell us about it. That's, that's why. We can tell that. But the reason why I brought the, the milk is I watched a film last night, which was very moving. I could have talked about my favourite film to do with cities and towns and deprivation and inequalities, which was Parasite, which was came out a couple of years ago, which is awesome. Watch it. But I watched Andrea, um, Andrea Arnold's Cow last night, and it's a film 
It's an hour and a half about a cow, the life of the four year life of a dairy cow. Now, it's a fascinating film. I absolutely recommend that you watch it. But the second reason why I brought the milk was I went to a workshop once in Amsterdam. And the question was, what are we going to do about the fact that all around our towns and cities is basically horsey culture? You know, the farms were closing. Uh, people were basically just having horses in paddocks around town. And the whole character of the landscape, as, as understood, I'm not saying it needs to be there forever, but as understood by the Dutch people was, it's not, this isn't what it's like. It's not meant to be like this. We have this beautiful green heart between us and Rotterdam. It's full of cows. Why is it not full of cows? So actually what was developed was a local milk policy that meant that every public authority, broadly speaking, had to buy local milk and local milk products. That is in itself, you haven't drawn anything, but you've made a huge difference to what things look like. So there's different subtle levers as what, you know. So planning is a kind of, it can be a subtle lever. It can be, we're going to connect that to that lever, you know? So anyway. Well, I mean, that's a fascinating insight. And um, I was going to ask you about what skills you think an urban designer needs and how your earlier studies all sort of fed into that because all, everything you've done, um, either relates to, it seems, architecture, buildings, or you've designed different things, whether it be gardens or greetings cards, um, and you've got an array of skills that you are now deploying in your role as RTPI president. So, I mean, for me, and I suppose, I suppose it's the transferable things that, I think the one, one for me is sensitivity, sensitivity and listening. Um, and I think there's two things there. You're listening to people and you're also listening to place. You're actually asking what the site needs. Um, and, and that alongside creativity, but creativity on its own, you could have a creative solution, but if it hasn't been what I, you know, co-produced with the community, and I like the way you picked out the, the young people in the Town Centre Fringe Master Plan, because we did loads of work. And we asked the kids, we said things like, how do you walk to the swimming pool? And effectively, the routes that they drew on the plans were anything but the direct one, because that involved going through the underpass, which is where you've got, you know, the ring road and that, mm. that you know, whole, whole set of issues that we could talk about. And not one of them would walk it because the perception was it was entirely unsafe to do so. So they're actually taking other routes to get to the, the, the you know, the most direct route wasn't attractive. So that's when we actually started to think about realigning the road network. And then the next question was really, well, well we've got a river there. What's, why, why aren't we using it? And obviously the perception was the river is dangerous, dirty, whatever. I mean, the word skern doesn't help, does it? The river skern. But if I <laughs> yes. told you that skern, get this, skern is Viking for bright water, which is what it is. You know, all of a sudden, the fact it used to have shopping trolleys yes. and traffic cones in it and you could walk across it on a hot day, yeah. all of that melts away and people go, well, why aren't we doing more with the river? And that you'll see in the master plan, there is a huge, and it was in partnership with the Environment Agency, a natural yes. flood management scheme, which, to be fair, at the time, fairly innovative, thinking about working with nature. Oh, very. I, th I thought that that document was way ahead of its time um, and is resonant of lots of things that co government's currently saying about design codes. But I've just got to move on um, because I've got lots of things I want to ask you about. Let me just give you an opportunity to, to explain to our young viewers what the benefits are of joining your professional body. Well, multiple, really. Um, I, think, I think, well, clearly credibility because you're a planner, you know, you're in the Royal Town Planning Institute, that makes a huge difference. But there's all the learning, the CPD, the shared experience. It's actually really difficult being a planner. Um, I'm doing a speech on Sunday to the Sri Lankan Planning Association and actually reading their journal, you think, oh, you're dealing with the same problems we are, you know, in terms of trying to get your message across, getting people to think more than three years ahead, um, trying to engage with communities that have been, you know, promise stuff and then don't get it or whatever, and or disengaged or don't, don't understand what you're talking about. Um, and also resourcing. So all those things are kind of commonalities. So as an institute, we can fight your corner for that. You've got lots of people you can hang out with. The young planners are, are really on it. I mean, the young planners do great stuff. They have innovative, you know, networking and CPD events, you know, not least of which is they just ring each other and go to the pub, you know. And, and it's like, <laughs> so, so there's actually a lot, there's a lot going on. And, and it's a jolly nice bunch of people. So if I was a, a young planner, I would definitely be wanting to be in the Institute. Excellent. Um, you know, I started too late for that, you know. <laughs>
<laughs> not at all, not at all. So moving on, I noticed that in your inaugural speech, you mentioned a couple of topics in particular, mm -hmm. naturally uh, levelling up. Uh, and I, I wonder, please, um, can you explain to our listeners um, what is meant by levelling up? And with regard to the uh, white paper, mm. I'm interested in the RTPI's um, take on that. What is there in there that you can support and what do you think is missing? Cool, right, back to levelling up. <laughs> levelling up for me, it's, it's really about tackling those structural determinants that mean that we have terrible inequalities in terms of health, economic performance, life chances, um, quality of life, all those things, you know, that, that to me is the, the main the main thrust of what levelling up is all about. And I think there needs to be a recognition in that, that in many ways, that the, the, the many parts of our country that are kind of what people call left behind now were once the engines of everything that was happening. You know, there was no, you know, without the, the coal or the steel or whatever, not, you know, much of what we have wouldn't have been there. So I think levelling up is also a little bit about restoring and healing and putting something back uh, into, those, into those communities. And, you know, I, I work in places where, you know, and it seems like most things everybody talks about, third generation unemployment nearly, you know. Mm. There's places where, you know, everything's, everything's moved away from there and it needs kind of sorting out. So I think that in terms of the solutions, the RTPI will, will and does support a well-funded and resourced planning system. And, and that kind of needs to be a strategic scale as well. Now, in the absence of what we might call strategic planning, there are other mechanisms we're championing. So things like green growth boards. Um, but the main thing is that multi-agency approach to the, the wider curation of place is absolutely essential. And of course, infrastructure. So, um, well, I mean, infrastructure working at different levels, but clearly we do need the infrastructure if we're going to achieve the changes that we need. Um, but I can talk about that further in fact there was another question potentially that might be a better thing to talk about infrastructure okay all right um climate change was another topic of your inaugural speech yeah. um and i wonder what steps your institute is taking to help their members um play their full role in achieving climate change it's such a right. sort of massive topic but on the ground how are you helping <laughs> there's two there's two sides to it there's the institute itself and then there's the institute you know, helping us as professionals to, to, to kind mm. of sort this out and be part of the solution, as they, as they say. And in many ways, we have things like plan the world you need. So plan the world we need. So that's the big, the big overarching document. Uh, we've done, done a publication with the Town and Country Planning Association, our friends there. So there's a lots of advice and guidance about that. And then some really innovative stuff. And I mean, get this, it's, I think it's innovative because a lot of people go, what? They think that, you know, a lot to do with climate change is sort of fixed carbon emissions from buildings and stuff. And actually a lot of them are actually people getting to and from said buildings. So actually that locational element, which planning is really, really good at, is actually a key thing in terms of climate change. And then you lay on top of that, you know, all the other multi-layered understanding, which is kind of the, the sensibilities of being a planner around green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, et cetera. And you're into something that, you know, the RTPI has got a lot of material. So you can look at it in detail and just search for climate change or actually you can just look at our output and go, all right, you know what? There's something to do with climate change in most of that, I would have said, um, because there's, there's, there's like climate change inequalities and health and well-being. Mm. They all kind They're of all interlinked. Together. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Yeah. OK, but the last question I, I have for you, um, last, but I think by no means least, because I want to just talk about um, well-being, which was, again, a very key part of your inaugural address. Can you explain why and how or what it is you'd want to see um, uh, in terms of embedding good practice to enhance well-being? Sure. I mean, well-being for me is, is when we say well-being, there's, there's some words that they use again, because it's the well-being of all beings. So it's not just like human well-being that we normally think about, because actually, if you extend the philosophy forward and take away the usual traditional Western subject-object relationship, there's me and there's all that stuff out there. And actually, we accept that actually we are nature and nature is, you know, us. 
I mean, things like microplastics are a massive reminder of that, aren't they? You know, you sit down to your piece of fish tonight, it's probably got plastic in there somewhere, even though you can't see it. And that's like a little example. But broadly speaking, if you think about the air you breathe, and indeed just the, the visual environment, we're taking 32 gigabytes a day of information. Let's make sure it's good stuff, you know, because they the green stuff, we are, not, you know, biophilic design is all about that. It's about, it recognises our affinity and affect. I, I actually really love the, the the fact that you've reminded us that well-being is not just about people, it's about everything. I mean, this just comes back, Charlie, if I may say, say so, to your trees tonight, you know. Mm. Uh, I, I, <laughs> funnily enough, I am eating some fish, but I'll try not to think about the plastics. Okay. Right, I, I must stop being selfish <laughs> and share you. And so I first of all would like to invite Sasha to ask his question. Sasha. What's your question? Thank you. I, thank you. Tim, my question is, is let's, as president, one of the problems we have is the negativity, particularly from the elected political classes towards planning. Their general starting point is one of, of trepidation, scepticism, concern about change brought about through the planning system. How, how can the RTPI get real traction yeah. with the members who are so influential in our system to get them to embrace, you know, the benefits of planning, not just not just the negatives. Well, we are reinvigorating the politicians in planning network. So uh, if you're a politician out there, and I hope there are some, mm. um, we are reinvigorating that and we'd like to create the, the, the forum where politicians can talk about planning. Um, when I was just thinking with, you know, when you're going through all your appeal decisions and all that sort of stuff, I mean, I'm in the business, you're in the business, but I do think it might be good to have David Mitchell on at some point to do the unbelievable truth, because <laughs> for a lot of people, you wouldn't be able to tell <laughs> between, you know. Um, and, and I think, you know, and I think it does expect a lot when you get to the intricacies of it. So, so I think, you know, that's not doing down because, I mean, there's a, there's a huge amount of very talented elected members out there. But I do think mm. that uh, we need to have a, a, much, a much sort of safer space to talk about, to talk about planning and, its, and the various different considerations. I think the second thing, though, and it's a big thing for me, is that um, politics, sadly, does run on a fairly short cycle, doesn't it? And actually, I've been exposed globally to things in, like, New Zealand, where they talk about being a good ancestor, you know, a 500-year plan. So I'm going to be really ambitious and say, actually, we're not just planning for 20 years. We should be planning for, like, 500 years, and then we'll work back from there. Because actually, I'd like to be judged in 500 years' time. I mean, you know, the kids get the history tablet out and they go, oh, what were they doing in 2022? Oh, man, alive, you know? So I think, you know, we, we kind of need to, you know, be kind of a little bit more awareness about how we'll be viewed uh, when we um, finally get reviewed, um, you know, so that's a thought. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sasha, for that. And Thank you, Tim, for your answer. Chris, what's your question, please? I love the idea of a 500-year plan. I love that. You know what? <laughs> I, I reckon we might have solved the housing crisis in 500 years. Don't get Chris started. He'll be oh, arguing for a 500-year oh. housing land supply. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> That's top Yeah, that would be, that would be interesting. Uh, look, I'm, I'm interested in what you uh, talk about around healthy new towns, because mm. you talked about healthy new towns. You've done a lot of work with the government. It's really important. Um and then you also talk about healthy old towns. And I think that's fascinating because we spend all our time looking at new houses or new employment, new development. The vast majority of people live in existing houses, 22 million of them. What, what should planners be doing about that? What conversations should we be having about that? Is it the Pathfinder, which we had 20 years ago, trying to clear entire neighbourhoods, just wipe the whole slate clean? Or what, what do you think we should be doing for the vast majority of people who don't live in new houses? Hmm. Thanks for that. I mean, I've been talking quite a lot about what I call deep retrofit. And I think when you think about it, it's more than just beyond the threshold. So, you know, if you, if you ask an architectural engineer, nothing wrong with that. But quite often it will be about the building and it will be what can we do to that building? And actually, I think we need to think about the whole neighbourhood and the opportunities that lie within that. So your standard terrace house has got a house, it's got a yard, it's got a yard that's probably full of kitchen and bathroom, actually, to be fair. It's got a back lane and then the same repeated. And then each one will have like an old redundant coal hole and a redundant outdoor toilet, probably. 
If we just did something simple like did underground waste storage like we do in new development these days, all that space at the back starts to become available for gardens. You could take down the coal hole, you could uh, take down the, you know, the redundant outdoor toilet and actually create housing then that could be retrofitted with you know, energy efficiency measures and everything else. And you think about you know, where you are in town, there's probably waste heat opportunities that would start to tackle field poverty. Moving back into the street, the amount of diffuse pollution that ends up just in surface water runoff in combined sewers is bonkers. And the savings that will be made in terms of intercepting that with bioswales and the like, integrated with your car parking and electric car charging, and all of a sudden your housing of last choice that's snapped up by private landlords then becomes potentially the old start at home thing where somebody buys it, cherishes it, tweaks it a bit, sells it on, makes a few bob and gets on the housing ladder. And I think that within that, there's the community aspect of which was lost if you just take it all down. And actually, you know what? It's a proper kick in the teeth, isn't it, for your heritage? Because actually some of this stuff, I live in a 1920 ones now, you know, and it's like, it's 100 years old. And you get to that age and, you know, it's got, it's got meaning, I think. So I think we wipe things out at our peril. And what does that say to the mental health of those people who, that was their pride, that was where they lived. And actually culturally where the grandma lived or the grandfather lived. So I think we've got to work a bit, a bit harder on being creative with what we have and saving all the energy that's all been, you know, baked a long time ago in bricks. I couldn't agree with you more. The uh, the clearance work uh, that was done in Stoke and Birmingham, I, I was involved in some big CPOs, huge resistance from the community who mm. did not want to have their entire street uh, removed. Um, I hear entirely what you're saying. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, Paul, what's your question, please? Uh, yeah, I've, I've got a bit of a run up to the wicket, Tim, as you'd expect, <laughs> since you're in my home county. Um uh, so Darlington, home of Vic Reeves, which is where uh, your accent is entirely recognisable from. Mm. Now that I realise it's the home of Vic Reeves, then I can't hear you without hearing him. <laughs> but it's also <laughs> just the home of Michael Lee, who Charlie and I will know is the drummer from Thin Lizzy and the Cult, who absolutely 100% Darlington. Mm -hmm. but, but Darlington is also the home of the world's first public railway uh, mm -hmm. that George Stevenson brought forward in 1825. And we led the world. In fact, that's what started the, the, the East Coast Mainline Railway. Mm -hmm. Leveling up and, and the agenda that's been promoted by government has a massive hole in the middle of it, which is for any of us that live in the north of England know that the infrastructure is hopeless in terms of the econ economy of it. The railways across to get from Manchester to Leeds are hopeless. We have a, a motorway which meant to, is meant to connect Manchester and Sheffield, which stops at Glossop. Um, we have a motorway that's meant to connect the northern part of Leeds with Preston, and it stops at Colm. Um, when, when, when do you think governments in the south will actually get that the north is the place which is the driving heart of the, the British economy and allow us to beat properly? <laughs> oh, well, it's a big one, isn't it? I, I, without being critical <laughs> about it whatsoever, but I think it's been a perennial problem, hasn't it? Um, I always jump around for joy when somebody actually makes that connection and says, you know what, we'll connect that provincial, but we'll connect that provincial town again with a railway because it makes sense and it just makes sense. Yeah. And actually a lot of the, the, the groundwork's been done. Um, where I live in Richmond, they've converted our former station, which closed in 1968 into a cinema and bakery and sweet shop and everything, which is awesome if you go there, but it's effectively an out of town shopping center. All the stuff that's in there is what you'd reasonably expect to be in the town center, but it's kind of a walk away. And I was the only voice I think about 20 years ago that was going, tell you what, why not? Railway station? That'd be a really good thing, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just, yes, it's all there, but about one bit that was like sold off. And all that work's gone in. I think it goes back to almost that retrofitting piece, isn't it? You know, there's been a huge amount of sweat and pain and loss to get infrastructure, which is currently sat there almost dormant, and then also to make those connections back. So I think there's that. And I do use in my inequalities talk about the railway track, because often we think we'll spend billions on getting from A to B, but then when you look out the window, it looks awful, and people are living really difficult, miserable lives on the wrong side of the tracks. You know, it's where you make your investment, isn't it? And big infrastructure, really exciting, you know, tackling small problems in provincial towns, well, not very exciting and, and difficult. So I, I think it's, it's not so much a political question, it's more a, a cultural question, isn't it? about what we value and how you get about. But certainly public transport is a nightmare up here. And if you're in a deprived community, the chances are 50% car ownership. The job is over there somewhere now, usually on a 
uh, you know, you can fund the junction and put the shed next to it. But how do you get there if you, mm. if you haven't got the money in the bank to even go and buy a bicycle? So we're back to the 19, you know, what, uh, you know, bicycle thieves, you know, <laughs> type yeah. thing. But yeah. in some communities, it's like that, you know, and, and that's really hard. Thank you very much. Charlie. Thanks, Mary. Uh, so a question sort of following on from that, really, about infrastructure, um, which you mentioned earlier on, Tim. And um, as viewers know, I'm, I'm from the Midlands and my kind of friends in Birmingham are split, really, about HS2. And I just wonder what your thoughts are on whether HS2 will will level up by making the Midlands and, and the other parts of the country will eventually reach uh, better connected or will it level down and make them dormitories so that uh, people who want nice houses who work in London and can't afford them will, will live in the Midlands and commute instead? I suppose, I suppose I'm going to answer your question, but I'll answer it in a way that might seem a little bit evasive, but it's not. Everything's changed in the last, for me, everything's changed in the last two years. I mean, when lockdown happened here, there was a bunch of people all running around. It's like they come from a different planet, you know? because they actually work somewhere else, but then they found themselves stuck here working. Mm. So <laughs> it's happening anyway in terms of, you know, well, that, that's why everything's so damn expensive. You can actually buy sourdough in Richmond because you <laughs> wouldn't do it on minimum wage around here. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> people that, that are making their money elsewhere and they kind of, they all appeared in lockdown. It's like, where, where you come from, you know? And I think that there's that kind of, that, that, so yeah. we need to reassess what, what going to work's all about. And actually, yeah. if you think about it, you know, train journeys, Many people aren't using them for leisure, you know. I mean, they could be, but actually, if you're thinking about the economy and work, you can work. It, it turns out we can work anywhere. You don't have to have the boss breathing down your neck anymore, do you? No. I mean, I've got my own Yorkshire mill owner telling me to keep going because I work for myself. But with everybody else, you know, yeah. it's like it does seem to work. So do we really have to think about, is it, I'll be, I'll be controversial, just 10 minutes off your journey to London really change yeah. that much when... To be fair, you can beam yourself anywhere now, like on Doctor Who. I mean, it, it doesn't matter, does it? You could be, we could be having this round the world right now. Yeah. As long as we're on Indeed. You know. Indeed, we often, we often are. <laughs> we often <laughs> are. So, some <laughs> some of us are very exotic in that, are travelling. <laughs> 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 have, I, have I quickly got time to ask an audience question? Yes. Um, because we, we have a great question here from Mark Johnson, um, and he asks... Uh, Tim, if you think that the UK planning uh, is in a good place right now, one major house builder has reported the planning system as being at an all time low. What do we need to do to restore the system? Is it more planners, better play, better pay for council planners or a more streamlined system? Massive point. F f massive point. Uh, uh, thanks, Mark. I'm going to say all three because you can, can't you? You know, because I'm ambitious, you know, mm. but, but actually we do need more planners because we need a plan. And actually, it requires the best minds to come up with the solutions of our age. And planning is at the heart of that. Definitely think that resourcing local authorities. I, I've, I've worked in local authority, and it's really, really tough. You know, you, the people I know who do it, who stick it out, must really love it. You know, because you're certainly not doing it for the rewards, you know, you know the money ones. It's mm. absolutely a passion for people. Yeah. And I think that's a great thing. But that only lasts for so long, doesn't it? You know? <laughs> that, that actually we do need to resource and pay people for doing what's a really important job. A planner, I think, you know, I maybe said this before to many people, is as important job as flying a jumbo jet. If a mm. jumbo jet crashes, there's a massive bang and there's loads of people die. So everybody goes, oh, that's really important. But actually getting planning wrong, the consequences down the line, quietly, lonely, not in your own home, etc. the consequences of that just carry on. And it's got a long tail on it. So we do need to do that. And then ultimately, um, the brave thing to do, wouldn't it, to be actually take a proper look at it and say, look, what's not working? Why is it really complex? And partly, why are, neighbor why are neighbourhoods and residents and communities kind of feeling so antagonistic. Mm. And I think partly it's a little bit about understanding. And I'm not saying that people don't understand the big issues. I just don't think they understand the detail of it. So there's something about just resetting how we frame what this is about, trying to express what the simple concepts are about, you know, what common sense says, and then we can get into the nuance of, you know, beauty and all the other aspects that we need. But often that just gets lost, doesn't it? It can be in turn on a sixpence with a legal argument, can't it? As you guys know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tim. I really, I really hope that you get the chance to um, travel uh, and enjoy your year as president. Back to you, Charlie. 
Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Tim, too. Uh, really, really fascinating discussion. Uh, we're going to be back in a couple of weeks' time. We're really looking forward to seeing you then. Um, in the meantime, stay safe tonight. Don't go outside if you're in one of those red, red areas. And if you are in one, um, get out quickly. I'm about to go and catch my train. If I miss my train, I think I can kite surf back to London in about five minutes tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, cheerio. Thanks again. See you next time. Thanks, Thanks Tim. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.